studies in English with honors and served as the Fulbright Interfaith Scholar and an Imam in the United States for three years. His PhD research focuses on the image of Islam and Muslims in North, in North America and actually the American media. He is the co-translator of the whole Quran into English and the author of a book titled The Nation of Islam and is also a contributor to the Encyclopedia of Muslim American History. He'll be speaking on the topic of da'wah amongst Muslims. Please welcome Imam Musa al-Khattab. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi So I'm gonna be talking for about 25-30 minutes. And I always, if you know me, I always like to keep my khutbahs and talks very short. I don't like to bore people to death. Uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So before I start my talk about doing da'wah to Muslims, I will remind you of the project we started a few uh, weeks ago, about three weeks ago, about uh, printing and distributing a pamphlet, a brochure, about the Prophet ﷺ to all the homes, not only in Edmonton, but the whole of Alberta. A million pamphlets would be printed and mailed to all the homes in Alberta. So we need your assistance. So far we have sponsorship for about 300,000 pamphlets and we still have about 700,000 more to go. So inshallah if you would like to make a contribution, inshallah you can go to a Rashid or you can pay online. Of course, da'wah is an obligation on every Muslim, male and female. And the Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Convey my message even in the form of one ayah and one hadith. Whenever we hear the word da'wah, we think about making da'wah to non-Muslims, but also there is da'wah to Muslims as well. Of course, the purpose of making da'wah to non-Muslims is to convey the message to them. Our goal when we convey the message of Islam to non-Muslims is not to convert them. This is not our job. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is told in the Qur'an. In عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا الْبَلَى Your role is only to convey, not to convert. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Say, O oh Muhammad, this is the truth from your Lord. Let those who want to believe, believe. And let those who don't want to believe, not believe. It's up to them. If they take shahada, alhamdulillah, and at the Rashid, we see an average of three to four people taking shahada every month, and this is a good thing, alhamdulillah. But at least if people don't take shahada and they don't, they don't come to the fold of Islam, they have at least a positive attitude toward Islam when we give them da'wah. So if someone says something bad about Muslims in the media, like faction news, and I've been doing my research for PhD for about five years, uh, on Fox News, and two things I have now that, that I didn't have back then when I first started my study of Fox News. Blood pressure and heart attacks. Okay? So those who follow Fox News, they know what I'm talking about. It's complete, they live in a different planet. They don't know what they are talking about. If you don't get people to have a positive attitude toward Islam and Muslims, now at least we can get them to hate us less. And this by itself is a success. Da'wah to Muslims comes in the form of nasiha, advice, which is, an advi which is an obligation on every Muslim. As the Prophet ﷺ says that one, one of the six rights of a Muslim and other Muslims is nasiha. When they need your advice, you have to furnish your advice. The nasiha comes in the form of correcting a wrong they do. If you see a brother smoking stuff, or drinking stuff they're not allowed to do, now you give them nasiha, you give them da'wah, so they stop it. If you see them not doing something good, something they're supposed to do, like salat for example, they don't pray. I don't like to use kudyam because I'm too short. If, if they don't pray, you give them nasiha to pray. So the nasiha is either to stop doing something wrong, to quit, or to do something good like salat. Or you try to correct the wrong ideology that some Muslims have. Some Muslims confuse Islam with the local cultures they bring from home. 
And this sometimes gives Islam a bad name. Okay, so don't confuse the culture, your culture from back home, with Islam. Those who work in the field of da'wah, they know that doing da'wah to Muslims is much more difficult than doing da'wah to non-Muslims. Why? Because here you have some non-Muslims, you give them da'wah, this is what Allah says, this is what the Prophet says, the Arkan of Islam, the five pillars and all that stuff. They don't have a problem with that, they either take it or leave it. But now, you come to give da'wah to a Muslim, and they start arguing with you, debating with you, and the worst thing you can do in this life is to debate with uh, someone who has two qualities, ignorance and arrogance. And they got the worst of the two worlds, okay? They start confusing culture, they start debating with you. And before I give you the qualities for someone who gives a da'wah to Muslims, I'll give you these two stories uh, that happened in Egypt a long time ago. I'm Egyptian, by the way. Like half of the speakers are Egyptian. This is something nice. <laughs> Dr. Jamal, by the way, Dr. Ala, and Saeed Rajah. No, he is Somali. Okay. So, this brother I used to work with at one of the local uh, TV channels in Egypt. And this guy, subhanAllah, he had gold from head to toe, necklaces and rings and everything, gold everywhere. If you want to get rich, you have to kidnap this guy. And ask for a million dollar ransom. Believe me, you'll get rich in five minutes. And I still have his card, by the way, if you want to kidnap him. Okay? <laughs> so this guy, I said, La hawla wa qatul. Brother, why do you wear gold? He said, I'm going to tell you the uh, secret. I said, don't you know that the Prophet says in the hadith in Bukhari and this? He said, yeah, 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 I know the hadith. Come on. Okay? I said, why do you wear gold? Convince me. He said, first of all, this gold, like this necklace for example, it's so precious to me because my mother gave it to me. Allah <laughs> alham What else? He said, this necklace for example, it has something that I love so much. It's a verse from the Quran that says, It says, that it has this uh, statement from the Quran that I love so much. It says, work for this dunya as if you are going to live forever, and work for akhirah as if you are going to die tomorrow. I said, La. <laughs> what is this man? It's not even in the Quran. He said, yeah, 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 hadith, hadith. And so it's not even hadith. What are you talking about? What is this man? It says, why is saying from some of the Sahaba? It's not Quran, it's not hadith. He said, I'll tell you the truth. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. When I don't wear gold, I can't breathe. I said, what? This is even worse than the first one. What does, ha what does gold have to do with breathing? Nothing, absolutely nothing. This guy is nuts, okay? So this is one. Then another time, I was giving a lecture in uh, South Carolina, two or three years ago, and I was talking about people who harmed themselves and about smoking and all that stuff. And this brother came to me and he said, you know what, I'm a heavy smoker and I like smoking. I'll never quit smoking. And, uh, and just uh, for your knowledge, 15% of doctors smoke. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm not going to smoke because 15% of doctors uh, smoke. And I'm not going to convert to... Uh, to Hinduism because a billion people are, are Hindus, okay? What does this have to do with anything? Okay, he said, I'm going to tell you something that will change your attitude about those who smoke. I said, well, tell me. He said, I'm going to tell you the benefits of smoking. <laughs> I said, okay, this is new to me. I never knew that smoking has some benefits. But I said, okay, I'll tell you something first. I will tell you that the benefits that smoking has before you tell me the benefits of smoking. Number one, if you smoke, you will never suffer from old age illnesses. Why? Because you die young. <laughs> this is a benefit, it's a good one. And number two, burglars will never break into your house at night. Why? Because you're staying up all night coughing. So they think you're awake, they will never break into your house from the kitchen. Number three, Dogs will never attack you when you walk in the street. Why? Because you age old, young, and you always have a cane in your hand. 
So when dark she can see a can a can in your hand, they will never attack you. These are the benefits of smoking that I know of. Now get out of here. So it's hard to argue with someone who doesn't have the knowledge and someone who is arrogant. They make your life miserable. If you find someone like this and they come to argue with you, with you and say nonsense, tell them, Jazakallah khairan, thank you, I'm busy, I have to. Because you're not going anywhere with them. If you argue with someone who has humility, someone who has knowledge, there will never be argument. Okay? They will, ne they will never argue with you if they have the knowledge. Now, what are the qualities you have to have before you give nasiha or advice to fellow Muslims? The criteria is given in the Quran, in, in several places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom. And good preaching, indeed Allah knows who are truly guided and those who are misguided. In another verse in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, O oh Muhammad, this is my way. I call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with basira, and basira means knowledge and wisdom. Basira, knowledge and wisdom, hikmah and ilm. And praise be to Allah, I'm not one of those who are misguided and those who commit shirk. Tayyip, before you give da'wah, you have to have these qualities. Number one, I'm going to talk about three of them today, then maybe some other time we're going to talk, inshallah, next year, if I'm still here. The first one is you have to be a qudwa, you have to be example yourself. How come you give nasiha to people and you don't practice what you preach? This is why most of the kids, they never listen to their parents because here you have a father who is smoking weed and telling his son, don't smoke, don't be an idiot. Smoking is not good for you. And you have a cigarette in your hand. What is this, man? You're nuts. They, you shoot yourself in the foot. To them, you look hypocritical. You say something, you do something else. And now you have this uh, mother who is telling her daughter, don't backbite people, it's too bad. And she's talking about her neighbors all the time. You see, this lady is fat, this lady is tall, this lady is skinny, this lady, she can't cook. What is this? You do something and you, something else, they will never listen to you. And you have this brother telling his Muslim brother, okay, you have to pray on time. And the sucker doesn't even pray, okay? <laughs> you have to be an example, you have to lead by example, okay? So people will follow you. الأمر الثاني وهو العلم You have to have knowledge. You have to have knowledge. You, can, you have to have this knowledge to give da'wah to people. And I remember a long time ago, this brother, he told me a story that happened in one of the uh, countries in Southeast Asia. They said they didn't have a qualified imam, so they just got a guy off the street to lead the salah to give them talks. I'm not going to mention the name of the country because they will shoot me in the head. But in any case, this brother, he told me that this fake imam, he was a volunteer imam, he didn't have the knowledge. He was uh, reading for them from a book that called, talks about Uthiyya, the requirements for Uthiyya, Qurbani, for Eid. It says in the book, and this is true in fiqh, It is recommended to have wudu for uthiyah. So he started to interpret what the book says. He didn't have the knowledge. He said it is recommended that you give wudu to the goat or the sheep before you kill it. I know it's very confusing when you read it. It is recommended to have wudu before you make uthiyah. Yeah, yeah, common sense. So he said, you have to make wudu for the goat before you kill it. Wash the ears, the nose, the feet, everything. So this poor guy, he came from the back and he was terrified and said, Shaykh, may Allah forgive me, I'm ignorant, I don't know. What about the uthiyah that I killed last year? Impure, I didn't, 
I was ignorant, I didn't know. Will that be accepted? He said, no, it's Najasa. Allah will not accept it. Can you pray without wudu? He said, no. He said, can you give wudhiya without wudu? Same thing. So making da'wah without knowledge is, is not something that will benefit you. You have to have the knowledge of yourself, of the people, and the knowledge of Islam. So you can make da'wah the right way. So you have to lead by example. And number two, you have to have knowledge. Otherwise, you will give Islam a bad name and you will harm Islam without even knowing. The last one that I want to focus on in, in my last, uh, what, 10 minutes is hikmah. And hikmah is a, is a huge thing. Hikmah is wisdom. And hikmah is not for everyone. It's a privilege, not a right. And this is what Allah says in the Quran. يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَى الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives hikmah, wisdom, only to those whom He wants. It's not for everyone, okay? It is not for everyone. It's only for those who want to get hikmah. How do I get hikmah? Well, you get hikmah by following the sunnah of the Prophet Do you know that the, hik the sunnah of the Prophet is always, always called hikmah in the Quran? وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And remember what is recited in your homes, the verse is talking to the family of the Prophet ﷺ, of the, the book, which is the Qur'an, and the hikmah, the wisdom. And that is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَةِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Allah has done a great favor to the Sahaba and to Muslims by sending them someone who teaches them the book, which is the Quran, and hikmah, that is the sunnah. So if you follow the Prophet Sallallahu you try to follow his sunnah, you will get hikmah. Just by reading the hadith and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu you will get hikmah. So what is hikmah? Hikmah is to say the right thing at the right time, to the right people, in the right way. This is hikmah, simple and clean, okay? To say the right thing, at the right time, to the right people, in the right way. So, for example, speaking of, yani, saying, or giving nasiha at the right time. You don't go and wake up someone at three in the morning to talk to them about cigarettes. They will just punch you in the face and they will go back to sleep. You have to choose your time. وفي الحديث الصحيح عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه في صحيح البخاري قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتخولنا بالموعظة في الأيام كراهة السآمة عليه. And this is what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did in this authentic hadith in Bukhari by عبد الله بن مسعود. He said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would pick the time carefully to give us نصيحة or to give us دعوة. He didn't talk to them all the time, like da -da -da -da, day and night. No, he chose the time carefully. When they are tired, he didn't talk to them. When they are hungry, he didn't talk to them. He waited for the right time and he didn't talk every day. Like to the, He didn't give khutbahs every day. No, when, when it was the right time, he spoke. So choosing the right time and choosing the right place. The Prophet if you read in the hadith, he never corrected anyone in public. He chose the right place. In the hadith, it says that the Prophet ﷺ, whenever someone did something wrong and he knew their names, he knew their names, he wouldn't give a khutbah and say, why did this guy do so and so? He never did it. He would say, why would some people say this or do this? And he would correct them in a very general way so he doesn't offend them. He never mentioned their names. Or, the Prophet ﷺ would take the person to the side and correct them secretly so no one would, would know about that the Prophet ﷺ corrected them. How do we know that the Prophet ﷺ corrected them? After the Prophet ﷺ, these Sahaba will mention the hadith and tell us this secret. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known about it. I'm going to give you one quick hadith story. This person, one of the Sahaba, his name was Khawat ibn Jubayr al-Ansari. And the hadith is authentic, it's in Sahih al-Tabarani. He said, I was a young man, he was a youth, 
17, 18 years old, and he just accepted Islam. He was a new Muslim in Medina. So he said, I went out with the Prophet to a camp, and in the break, I went outside to, you know, see the place. They were traveling outside of Medina. So he said, when I was passing there, I saw a few women sitting to the side and chit-chatting. They were probably non-Muslim ladies. So he said, I, I ran back to my tent. I put on my nicest clothes. I was shot. And I came back and I sat with the ladies and we started to cry, joke and chit chat and hey hey and all that stuff. And all of a sudden they came, the Prophet ﷺ came and he saw him sitting with the ladies. And he said, when I saw the Prophet ﷺ, I, I was shy. I didn't know what to say. The Prophet ﷺ was so honorable and so respected and so charismatic, I was ashamed. I didn't know what to say. Then the Prophet ﷺ came to me and said, what are you doing with the ladies? He said, well, I didn't know what to say. Then he said that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, smiled to me and I told him, Oh, Prophet Allah, I have a rebellious camel. It runs away all the time. And these ladies, mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the reward. They're making a rope for me, so I will tie my camel. And he said, by Allah, by Allah. When I said this to the Prophet ﷺ, he smiled. And by Allah, I was a liar. And the Prophet ﷺ knew I was lying to him. But he smiled and he left. He didn't say anything. Then we returned to Medina. And I was walking in the street one day. And I heard the Prophet ﷺ was coming behind me. He was walking. Because people started to say, Assalamu alaikum Rasulullah and all that stuff. So I knew he was coming. He was after me. So I started to, ro to walk fast. So the Prophet ﷺ walked faster than me. He started to jog and he caught up with me and he said, Ya Abdullah, Assalamu Alaikum, what happened to your wild camel? <laughs> so I said, La hawla wa la I didn't know what to tell him. Then he smiled and he left. Then he said, a couple of days later I was walking and I saw him, I took a turn and I saw him walking in front of me. I started to slow down so I don't catch up with him. He's going to ask me about the camel. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ, for some reason, he knew I was coming behind him, so he stopped and he said, Come here, come here. <laughs> Salaamu Alaikum Ya Abdullah, what happened to your wild camp? La <laughs> He said, Wallah, I didn't know what to tell him. Then the Prophet ﷺ smiled and left. Then he said, Another day, I was in the masjid praying Sunnah, Tahiyatul Masjid. Then the Prophet ﷺ came and he prayed Tahiyatul Masjid next to me and he sat down and knew he was coming for me. So I made my salah very long. I recited the longest surah in the book so he would get bored and leave. So the Prophet came close to me and he said, I got all day and I'm waiting for you. So he said, when he was finishing the salah, he said, Wallahi, I will give the Prophet an answer to put his heart at ease so he will leave me alone. So he finished, he made salam, salam, salam alaykum rasulullah and everything. Then the Prophet asked him the uh, customary question, Salaamu alaykum ya Abdullah, what happened to your wild camel? Is it still running away? He said, by Allah, ya Rasulullah, the good news is I have some good news for you. Good news. My camel has accepted Islam, it is not running away anymore. <laughs> so, in this hadith, in Sahih al-Tabarani, it's an authentic hadith, it says that the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he made dua for him, that Allah will give him barakah and bless him, then he left that there. Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ took him and humiliated him and taught and feathered him in front of other people, he would run away from Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ had a gentle heart and he was nice to people. When you make dawah to people, the people are not looking for a butcher, they are looking for a doctor. Someone to take care of them, someone to be nice to them. People need a sincere advice and they give a sincere nasiha. So they will come back to Islam. If they start calling the name Wallahi, they will never listen to you. They will never listen to you. And one of the techniques of the hikmah that the Prophet ﷺ used to make nasiha to people, before he will correct someone, and this is an excellent technique, he would say something good about them first, open their hearts, then in, inject the nasiha and leave it there. So in this authentic hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ knew that Abdullah ibn Umar was not praying 
Qiyam at night. He didn't pray at night. He just prayed the five salawat. He went to bed. He slept uh, the whole night and he didn't pray at night. So the Prophet said, نِعْمَ الرَّجُلُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ لَوْ كَانَ يَقُومُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَقَالَ سَالِمْ رَوْا الْحَدِيثِ فَوَاللَّهِ بَعْدَهَا مَا كَانَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنُ عُمَرِ يَنَامُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ So in this hadith, the Prophet knew that Abdullah didn't pray at night. So the Prophet said, Abdullah ibn Umar is an excellent man. I wish he could pray a few rak'ahs at night. He said he is a great man first, then he said, I wish he can do this to be an excellent, to be better. So it says that Salim, the narrator of the hadith, says, Wallahi, after this hadith, after Abdullah heard what the Prophet said, he used to sleep very little at night. He used to stand the whole night in salah because the Prophet said something positive about him first, then he corrected him. Now imagine if I go to the Tajweed halaqah that I do at the Rashid. And I see this brother, he comes, this is his first time to the masjid, he's 60 years old, he started to read. Oh, the tajweed is messed up, everything is in the basement. So I tell him, what is wrong with you? You're 60 years old, you can't read Arabic, get out of here. What is wrong with you? If you criticize them and you don't show them respect, they will never come back. But what I do, this is one of my techniques, I learned from the Prophet ﷺ, I say, MashaAllah, you, you got a beautiful voice. And the pronunciation, MashaAllah, excellent. Like uh, Abdul Basit, Nichawi. <laughs> if only you just fix the rules of Tajweed here and there. There are a few, there are not many. He can't he can even pronounce a single correct Tajweed ruling. But I tell him, Alhamdulillah, everything is good. There are just a few things here and there we'll fix and you'll be excellent, inshallah. You will be a qalib. So people show up every day and MashaAllah, they improve. So hikmah in choosing the right time, the right place, and speaking to in the, in the right way. And as I said, if you correct people with sincerity, you don't do this so people will call you a good man, you say it to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you hope to correct this brother and sister in the right way. And if you speak to people with respect, and in the right way, and in the right manner. You show respect to them with sincerity. Believe me, they will change. I'm going to conclude with this story. I've got two more minutes to go. I'm sure most of you never heard of this man, Al Qa'nabi. And this is one of my favorite stories. I said, uh, said it at the Rashid several times. Al Qa'nabi, he is one of the most famous people in Islam that you probably never heard of. He's very famous, but to a certain people, but most of us never heard of him. Al Qa'nabi was a youth, okay? He was 20 years old, 21 years old, and he was a drunkard, okay? He used to drink. He was a bad boy, okay? So he used to sit in front of his house and drink alcohol. And back then, they used to have a special clothes for the bad people, the bad boys. If you see the guy with the uniform, you know he is a bad guy. So he sat in front of his house waiting for his friends to come and drink with him, and he had the bottle of wine in one hand and he had the knife in the other hand. So what happened? He saw a man on a donkey and hundreds of people are following this man. Okay? So he said, and people are pulling the donkey, they are almost carrying the donkey with the sheikh on top of the donkey. He said, what? what's wrong with these people? Are they drunk? They're following a man with a donkey? Okay. If it's a famous man, he should have a horse, a Rolls Royce car, Toyota, anything, but not a donkey. A donkey was not a good thing back then. So I said, what's wrong with these people? I'm going to go check them out. Then he went close to the people and he said, who is this guy you are following, you people? Then he said, this is Shoba ibn Hajjaj. He said, okay, what does he sell? Who is this guy? They said he is the most knowledgeable scholar of hadith. Shoba ibn Hajjaj was very famous in Baghdad.